It's my really very great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this very special guest lecture uh, with David Willits, MP. Uh, as a leading figure in the Conservative Party and of course Shadow Universities and Skills Secretary, uh, we're absolutely delighted to welcome <coughs> David to Warwick. Uh, David himself was educated locally at King Edward's School, Birmingham, and then went on to Christchurch, Oxford, where he studied philosophy, politics, and economics. Having served as a private researcher to Nigel Lawson, he went on to take charge of the Treasury Monetary Policy Division, aged 26. Goodness me. Uh, before he moved over to Margaret Thatcher's policy. Explains a lot went wrong, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> He subsequently took over the Centre for Policy Studies, a Conservative policy think tank. Uh, David has been the Conservative Member of Parliament for Haven since 1992, and prior to his current role, served as Shadow Secretary of State for Education and Schools, Shadow Secretary of State for Trade and Industry under Michael Howard, and Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions under Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, David is, of course, the author of several books, including Why Go Conservative, Modern Conservatism, and, of course, he's joined us this evening to talk on the subject of his most recently published book, A Pinch, How Baby Boomers Took Their Children's Future and Why They Should Give It Back. And there are copies liberally distributed around the room, and I'm told it's actually sold out at the university bookshop, so we'll have to wait for a while. Um, the Pinch has received much media attention since its publication earlier this month, and it's been widely praised, being described, for example, as a hard-hitting account of the generation <coughs> that took the houses, jobs and welfare, uh, a fascinating journey through British society, and a treasure trove of elegantly harvested statistics and a tremendous synthesis of social analyses. Clearly, the pinch has been well informed by the wealth of knowledge that David has on issues of social mobility and welfare reform, and we look forward very much to hearing more about his themes and conclusions through his lecture this evening. We hope that tonight will provide a kind of vacation for David uh, from the political fray, and one which will allow him to concentrate on his intellectual interests, uh, which I know have drawn you here this evening. So without further delay, I'd like you to invite David to take the stage. David, over to you. Thank you very much, indeed, Nigel. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, Warwick is an excellent university, and I'm delighted to be back here. And Warwick University also has a very effective and powerful presence on iTunes U. And my great aspiration in life is that this uh, lecture that I'm going to give this evening might perhaps make it onto <laughs> iTunes U through your, through your excellent facility. Because I think the themes in my book the pinch, just <laughs> out a couple of weeks ago, are ones which would pay wide reading and study. Um, now, that isn't product placement, I don't know what it is. But uh, it is, I think, a very serious uh, and important question, the balance between the generations. It's what I try to tackle in my book in a non-partisan way. Uh, and I'm trying to take the opposite view from the, from the conventional wisdom of leading Demographers. Over the centuries, the people who thought about demography, the great writers on it, Thomas Malthus uh, in, the, in 1798, then Auguste Comte, probably the founder of sociology, and most recently, one of the great American demographers, Richard Easterlin, they all assumed that there was a pattern to human affairs because being a big cohort was such bad news. Being a big cohort meant that you went through life economy class, not business class, and it was going to be tougher if you were in a big cohort. Uh, now, I want to challenge you this evening to think of the question, if you had a choice, would you rather be in a big cohort or a small cohort? And to argue that it may be better, it may have turned out better, if we instead thought of what Keynes observed. And Keynes was one of the first people to reverse the conventional wisdom. What Keynes argued, and he got very interested in demography at the same time as he was writing the general theory, 
Keynes thought that if you were in a, if you had the birth rate falling, you had smaller and smaller cohorts, this meant there'd be less consumption, less borrowing. He was one of the first people to think actually being in a big cohort was good news. More consumption, more borrowing, more spending, more growth. The only slight problem <coughs> is that he wrote this at, at a time when the birth rate was very low, absolutely convinced, as we see from his quote, that um, we, have, he, we should be faced in a very short time with a stationary or a declining level of population. Now let's look at what actually happened. Uh, Keynes uh, wrote his, uh, produced his book when the, and it's argued that we knew that the population would be stationary or falling when the British population birth rate, this is a chart for numbers of children born each year in the United Kingdom through most of the 20th century, he, wrote, he made that statement when we were about there. And he was promptly disproved by one of the biggest <laughs> baby booms we've seen in British demographic history. And although there is no kind of authoritative, totally agreed definition, what I've got here is a definition of the baby boomers that I think works, which is the people born between 1945 and 1965. And it includes the twin peaks of the British baby boom. The first peak in 1947, the pe second peak, peak in 1964. But even at the low point in the middle, in the 1950s, we were still having 800,000 babies born in Britain every year, a higher figure than we've achieved in subsequent cycles. So that's my definition of the baby boom. I think that this chart tells you more about post-war British history than any other chart I can think of. For a start, these, this first peak of the baby boom, these are the people who walked down Carnaby Street in their bell bottoms in the early 60s and bought the Beatles CDs, the people born in that surge of the mid in the mid-40s. These are the people who were buying punk rock and were protesting at the poll tax when they were in their 20s in the mid-80s. <laughs> this low birth rate in the 1930s is one of the things that made Thatcherite control over public spending possible. Because what that tells you is that there was no increase in the number of pensioners and in public spending on pensions through the 1980s and 90s. In other words, these generated very favourable fiscal times because <coughs> There wasn't an increase in the number of pensioners claiming benefits. Meanwhile, the labour market changes of factories were made possible by these generation. This, this, this baby boom was surging into the labour market and driving economic change, coming in with new sets of skills, new attitudes, driving the industrial change of Britain. Then after that, we had this plummet in the birth rate down to a low point in 1976. <coughs> For those of you who think that behind all the economics and the demographics, there's really some very simple, some very simple explanations of human behavior. You may know that the two peaks of the baby boom occurred after the long, cold winters of 1947 <laughs> and 1963, and the low point occurred after the hot summer of 1976. So let's just observe that and move on. Uh, but then you have this, so you have this big fall in the birth rate in the 1970s, which also meant that through the 1980s and 90s, there was not any pressure on school spending either. There was not a large number of kids coming along behind. So if you've got a society where you've got a bunch of workers in the middle and not many old people ahead of them and not that many kids coming along behind, it's a very favorable circumstances for labor market change and control over public spending. We've then got this further sort of mini surge in the birth rate peaking uh, in about 1992, which is why applications to universities are rising fast and why it's going to be very tough getting to, it was tough last year, it's going to be tough in 2010 because these, the products of this mini baby boom in the early 90s are 18 or 19, tough times then. Then there was this, this further fall um, and a new uh, dramatic surge in the birth rate currently underway. So I think that this this tells us um, quite a bit about uh, post-war Britain and the size of the swings we're talking about. I mean, the gap between a low point almost 
uh, below 700,000 at a high point of a million, a back, that gap of 300,000, compares with the total loss of British lives in the Second World War of 400,000. So the swings in the size of cohorts <coughs> that we're taking, talking about here, where if you look over a few years, we're talking about swings of more than a million people, are greater than the size of the, the loss of population because of the Second World War. So we, in other words, we're talking about big swings that affect the labour market, that affect public expenditure. You might argue as well, for example, that this low point in the birth rate in the late 70s meant not many people coming through into the workforce with skills ready to work aged, say, 25 in at the turn of the century, and maybe one of the reasons why we had such large levels of immigration then. This was a, a gap in the workforce that matches quite neatly the immigration of the, the past few years. So there's, there's quite a lot of economic and social change that I think we can help to understand with this chart. Now, today, in 2010, I think is a very good moment to be contemplating demography for another reason as well, that we are at a moment of equipoise, that the middle person in Britain today is now aged 40. And life expectancy in Britain is about 80. So the middle person in Britain <coughs> is halfway through their life. The m m half of people in Britain are going to, can look to 2050 as being within their likely life expectancy. So if we're asking people to look ahead 40 years, we're asking the, the just the majority of Britain, British people today, to think about what might happen during their lives. And I believe that one of the things that uh, we should consider, and that's fundamental to what holds that society together, is what I call the intergenerational contract. And the intergenerational contract works very well if you don't have big changes in the size of cohorts, if you instead imagine a society where cohorts are all roughly the same size. And in those circumstances, what happens is that there are times when you are receiving, there are times when you are contributing, times when you are receiving. And let's get back to the real fundamentals. Imagine a, tr a tribe of hunter-gatherers, and there are still some surviving tribes of hunter-gatherers in Latin America, in Africa, that have been studied. And let's think not about even nuclear families <coughs> or states. Let's go to the fundamentals of natural life. Let's think of calorie consumption. How much calories we are consuming and how many calories we are generating by our activities as hunter-gatherers. And if you think about it, uh, we know one of the features of Homo sapiens is that we by and large go for quite high value food, but you need quite a bit of education and training to develop the skills to access this high value food. So the anthropologists have measured the calories <coughs> that are consumed by and generated by individuals in these tribes of hunter-gatherers. And what do they find? Well, when the, when the kids are very young in these hunter-gatherer tribes, they're clearly very heavy consumers of calories, and they don't generate many at all, as any parent could tell you. So for the first few years, they're very he heavy net users of calories. <coughs> then they carry on through childhood still not generating as many calories as they are consuming. They then become skilled hunters, and as skilled hunters, they're then generating more calories than they do consume until towards the end of their times as hunters, they are, their ability to hunt or to gather starts declining, and again, they reach the stage where their calorie consumption, as with the children, exceeds their calorie generation. And what do the anthropologists think in these hunter-gatherer tribes at the crucial ages of transition? Well, you might recognize them. They think that you become a net generator of calories when you are aged 18, and you become a net consumer of calories again in these hunter-gatherer societies when you're about 65. So if you think of a stable society where what is happening is the hunters <coughs> in the middle are generating surplus calories which are being <coughs> transferred to the children and to the retired hunters. That's a model that we can understand. It's a model that happens in families. 
It's a model that I think is the shape of the welfare state. And in Paul Samuelson's classic article on pensions and saving, he gets to the heart of this. At any one time, it might look as if <coughs> we, the hunters, are shifting, giving resources to kids or to retired hunters, but across our entire life cycle, it evens out. In fact, we are using other people in a way to ensure, as a kind of insurance scheme, so that, that when we are old, we ourselves become net beneficiaries, and when we die, it evens out at zero. That's a kind of, that's a kind of very simple model of how a, tribal, uh, a, a tribe works, and we know from anthropologists how it works. It's also, you could argue, how family works, how welfare state works. And I think, if you look into it a bit more detail, there's several different ways in which we can think of these contracts, these exchanges that are happening between generations in this stable society that I'm describing to you. Um, and they are different forms of uh, reciprocity. I have a chapter of the book when I try to get into sort of reciprocal altruism and what we now understand from game theory and evolutionary biology as the kind of origins of our ethical obligations. And here are some of the intergenerational contracts that we might imagine. Only one is a direct exchange, the first one. If we care for our children when they're young, they will care for us when we're old. But there are other types of exchanges. If we care for our parents now they're old, our children will care for us when we're old. These are the, that's the kind of cat's cradle of intergenerational obligations that makes a society go around. And I believe this is the, this is the real social contract. <coughs> the social contract should be thought of as a contract between different generations. In fact, when Edmund Burke, the great conservative philosopher, was describing the role of government and the <coughs> state, he didn't, as you might have expected, give a definition in his reflections on the revolution in France, which was all about the night watchman state or security and glory <coughs> order or armies and national defense. Those functions are. His ultimate explanation of the description of the state was a contract, and as he said at the end of this very long quote, a <coughs> partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are, who are to be born. We are all of us, um, uh, we're, we're, we're all of us leaseholders, not freeholders. We're all participants in a set of intergeneration exchanges which began before we arrived and carry on after we depart the sea. So that is, I think, a very powerful account of what it is that holds a society together. But what happens if instead of my stable model, I've given you a stable model where you have successive generations of the same size and these exchanges carry on, what happens if you have a baby boom? For whatever reason, what happens if you've got a cohort that's bigger and uh, Think of it as a, one of the classic images, think of a python swallowing a pig, working its way through a large generation that starts off at the beginning, then there's a large generation in the middle, large generation that works its way through. And there are different ways we can try to imagine the impact of such a generation, but let's start with a very simple example from uh, government budgets. Imagine a government has a rule which sounds very prudent, to come the phrase, that the government will budget, will balance the budget over the economic cycle. Because we go through the ups and down swings, we will overall, across the economic cycle, run a balanced budget. And imagine they've also got a set of public expenditure commitments that are stable. That doesn't mean the exact size of the program is fixed, but it means that you've got commitments to educate people, to pay pensions to people, to deliver health care to people. And those commitments remain stable to each individual. So you've got what looks like a very prudent system, a balanced budget and a stable public expenditure commitments. <coughs> now let's think through how that would operate, how that rule would operate if you've got a very large cohort coming through the system. First of all, this large cohort are all kids. So what you notice is an increase in education spending. And as you've got a stable commitment to educate each child and you're balancing the budget, your public expenditure on education rises, and you need to increase the taxes that your working population are paying so as to finance the uh, education needs of this large cohort. Then the large cohort get into the middle of their lives, and they are workers. 
and you've got a large cohort of workers with fewer kids coming along behind and not so many old people, so you've got lower public expenditure commitments relative to the size of your working population and consistent with your balanced budget rule, you can bring down taxes. And then your large cohort becomes older and starts being recipients of pensions and health care. And so public expenditure on those programs rises. And there's a same time, there's a shrinkage of the size of the working age population. And you need to extract more tax from them, partly because there's a big expensive public expenditure program on pensions and health, partly because there are fewer workers. So public expenditure commitments rise and taxes have to rise to maintain your balanced budget rule. Now, if you've been that big generation, if you think through the system, you've enjoyed your education, paid for on the same terms as everyone else. When you were workers, you enjoyed lower taxes, prudently affordable, because your government was meeting its expenditure commitments. And then when you retired, you had pensions and health care paid for by higher taxes from the smaller generation coming on behind you. In other words, a balanced budget and a stable set of public expenditure commitments worked to the advantage of the large cohort at each stage as it went through the process. So that is a very simple way of thinking through what happens if these intergenerational exchanges are no longer between cohorts of the same size, but between cohorts of different sizes. And that is, that's, uh, now, there's nothing there about the motivations of any generation in which, in that society, they may have just thought they had a set of neutral rules that they were properly enforcing at each stage. So I'm not getting into motivation as to, but I am trying to show how different cohort sizes can have effects. And what I'd now like to do is to trace in a bit more detail what we, what we are able to uh, see from evidence I've assembled in my book, and this is evidence that's sometimes quite hard to pin down because by and large in our country, we don't think so much about different generations. We're very sensitive to gaps of income and class within generations. We don't think so much into generation. What I'm trying to do is measure through, first of all, the welfare state, secondly, through the labor market, and secondly through, and thirdly, through property ownership, what seems to be the, the situation of successive generations. Here's, first of all, some calculations done by John Hills of London School of Economics <laughs> as to how he thinks over their lives different age groups gain or contribute to the welfare state. What he's calculating is clearly that those, some of that, that very early generation, the beginning of the 20th century, he thinks they're going to take out from the welfare state 122% of what they put in through taxes and national insurance contributions. Perhaps because they were around when they were the first beneficiaries of the Lloyd George welfare state and then the wealth and then the happy welfare state. And you can see that um, there's a peak for the people in the baby room who achieve almost as good a return, peaking up, getting out from the welfare state 118% of what they put in. But then on his figures, and they okay, they require heroic assumptions, you have to predict what happens to levels of tax and welfare commitments. But it looks as if then there is a steady decline in the post-boomers, on his calculations, will be paying more in through taxes and national insurance than they're likely to be extracting during their lifetimes from the welfare state. So it does look as if, um, on about the only calculation that's been done in Britain on this effect, it does look as if the baby boomers do well out of the welfare state. <coughs> Let's now turn um, to the Treasury's separate set of forecasts of public spending on the welfare state. And here you can see, oops, sorry, hang on. Let's go back to the stage. Oops, wrong button. <coughs> Here you can see um, public expenditure programs growing because of mainly these demographic effects. And if you then look at the total, this is not total public expenditure, this is public expenditure on the key functions of the welfare state. Um, 2007, running at about 20% of GDP. Keeping public expenditure commitments stable, so this is not in, not trying to add to expenditure on individuals, it's just assuming there's a stable commitment, they reckon that you add 6.5% of GDP to public spending over the next 50 years, simply because of changes in the demographic composition of the population. So that's what they think happens to the shape of the welfare state. Now, in their document, Long-Term Fiscal Trends, 
Um, they claim that this increase in public expenditure is offset by reductions in non-age related spending as a percentage of GDP in ways that are very hard for the rest of us to understand. <coughs> so that this is the this is the fiscal impact on the Treasury's own figures, these are not my figures, of changing demographics stretching out in front of us. So that tells us we face fiscal headwinds when the pressures will become more spending because of the welfare state commitments. So we can see how as the baby boomers age, they are likely to be driving increases in public spending on welfare state. Let's turn to the, the second thing I, re I refer to. After we've looked at the welfare state impact, now let's look at the jobs market impact. Now here, uh, we can see it very dramatically helping in the recession, uh, as an effect of the recession. Here we can see that, and I had, um, we've gone through, assisted by a researcher, I've gone through historic earnings surveys to try to get the, relate, the relationship between the earnings of someone in their 50s and someone in their late 20s. Um, in, the, in the mid 70s, someone in their late 20s earned almost as much as someone in their 50s. But now someone in their 50s earns significantly more, a third more than someone in their late 20s. And as we know, during this recession, we've had a very, job, very dramatic change in the composition of employment and this is the long-term trend behind it. This is a breakdown of, of employment, we based it at 1992 as 100. This is what's been happening to the composition of employment. And we can see employment amongst the over 50s on an up trend, and employment amongst the over 50s has continued to grow during the recession to a record high. This is, the, this is what's happening to employment as a whole, 25 to 49 year olds, modest, and here 24 and under is forward. So you've got a change in the composition of the labour market going on. Now again, there's lots of reasons. It's partly due to just the size of different cohorts. It's partly to do with more people staying on in education. But within the jobs market, as the baby boomers have gone through uh, the labour market, they've kept their work with them and they are now clearly um, remaining in employment during the recession, whilst it's hard for young people to get into the jobs market during this recession. There may be lots of reasons for this. I personally would speculate that one reason is this is the first recession we've had when companies' pension liabilities have all been on the balance sheet. And so, whereas in the past it was quite neat for some companies to shed older workers and make them in charge on the pension scheme, that's far less attractive once you've got a property account for that and your, and your pension sharing, scheme sharing deficit. So you hold on to those workers and you just don't recruit new workers. But there's been a change in the composition of employment, a change in labour force participation. Then thirdly, after the welfare state, after the labour market, what's been happening to wealth? Now there are different measures of wealth, and I offer several over the next few slides, but roughly in Britain we own net overall about 6.7 trillion Pounds and the two most important assets that we've got are housing and pensions. Now I'm now going to show you several different measures of this and they're not, they're measured on different bases, some, handful, some defined by to let in one way, some in another way, some include unfunded pensions, some don't. So, don't. so they're not commensurable with each other, but each is internally consistent. Here are some new figures on the distribution of housing. Uh, which I've just obtained, and I'm grateful to the Pensions Policy Institute for these calculations. What do they show? They show very clearly that in this incredibly narrow group, people aged 50 to pension age, which is a smaller group than my definition of the baby boomers, this is just pe this is me men aged 50 to 65 and women aged 50 to 60. Within that one age group, you've got almost a half of all net housing wealth. Um, and in reality, there's going to be um, some boomers in that category as well. So you've got a concentration of housing wealth in those people in the middle, much greater than the generations on my side. Here are some estimates of pension wealth. Now this is, these are estimates that also include unfunded public sector pension promises, but doesn't include state benefits. What do we see? More than half of all pension wealth belongs to people aged between 45 and 64. And uh, the older generation ahead, with uh, 
much less pension wealth. And as we know, for the younger generation coming along behind, much harder to get started in pension schemes. So they own much less pension wealth. Pension wealth is concentrated in the hands of the baby boomers in the middle. Here's another set of calculations from John Hills, actually, in his recent report on equality, where he's tried to look at average wealth per person by age. And again, very similar story of an extraordinary concentration amongst those people um, in the middle. And this is my attempt as a layman, and there will be people in this lecture hall uh, today who are much better able to do these estimates properly than I am, but drawing on several sources and assisted by some outside bodies, including the Council of Mortgage Lenders and the um, IFS. This is my attempt at breaking down that 6.7 um, trillion pounds of assets between the age groups. And this is what uh, this lets me, it has led me to conclude that this leads me to conclude that the, here we are, 3.5, um, just over half of the 6.7 trillion, I believe, belongs to baby boomers. Now, you could argue that it's always going to be like this. You could argue that this is just a life cycle effect. And of course, young people don't hold uh, much. And of course, when you are in the middle of your life and you're earning a lot, that's when you have all your money, and then you run your wealth down. But that's, and it's very hard to get a, this kind of data across time. But there are some very strong ex reasons to believe that it's going to be very hard for the younger generation ever to build up the kind of housing wealth or the kind of pension wealth that we're seeing here <coughs> in the hands of the And that's why, and I offer some explanations as to why this may be a once-off effect favoring one particular cohort. Inflation came along at the right time. So first of all, the baby boomers bought their houses with big mortgages attached, and then inflation came along, very high levels in the 1970s and 80s, which reduced the real cost of their mortgages just after they'd taken them out, extremely convenient. Improvements in life expectancy came at the right time. So if you've got a pension promise, if you've got a promise to pay you an income from the age of, 90, from the age of 65, um, the value of that promise is transformed. If you imagine if the company that made you that promise thought you might live for five or ten years from the age of 65, and they cost it on that basis. But the value of that promise is transformed if as you get close to 65, you're actually it's discovered that you're going to live 15 or 20 years. It means the net present value of that promise goes up. And this is, um, this is an effect that has particularly helped the baby boomers and has left companies, this is my third point, very reluctant to offer any similar kind of promise to younger workers coming along behind. So it looks as they're beneficial from the transformation of life expectancy. Even the banking bailout, protecting the, um, the, the deposits and the um, uh, securities uh, held by pension funds and annuities, and the bailout financed by taxation and borrowing, which is going to be a burden on the younger generation to carry on paying their taxes. Now, as I say, I'm not getting into the language of motives or selfishness, but you can see a range of effects, some which may be chance effects, that have particularly helped this generation. Now, some people do speculate about motives. Are the baby boomers just lucky? Are these just random events? And some of them may be random events. One of the reasons for the labor market effect is globalization. And here, nobody could have predicted exactly when India and China would enter the world trading system and compete down the wages of particularly younger workers. Are the boomers selfish? Well, I don't think that the boomers are a particularly selfish generation. Are they redistributed? There is a, a, a respectable argument in economics that future generations, because of economic growth, are always going to be richer, so they become very keen on redistribution <coughs> to us now from rich future generations, which I think is a, a dangerous argument, which is probably the one that is most corrosive of the intergenerational contract. Or is it just that um, the baby boomers aren't thinking in the way that I try to get them to think in this book? They aren't thinking about successive generations and how they do out of society. Uh, so there is a, a range of possible explanations. This is a rather, 
This is a rather worrying piece of examples of, of popular attitudes. I found it in, in the DWP research report. Uh, some light reading. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what this showed was quite interesting. When you presented people with, with questions about how they thought the rising cost of, what they should think should be the correct public policy response to the rising cost of pensions, and essentially young people thought you'd have to allow the pension to fall in value or raise the age of the pension, but they wanted that keys on raising on keeping the pension promise and higher taxes to pay for it. The older you got, the more you thought the crucial thing was to maintain the value of the pension promise and increase taxes in order to pay. So here is some exact evidence of generational attitudes on this. Um, but there are also, I think, deeper reasons why we appear to be failing to discharge the intergenerational contract, which is in Britain, we have more and more segregation by age. The labour, the way you work is more and more segregated by age. People are very likely to work in companies with people roughly the same age as they are. And we have age segregation in where you live as well. People are more likely to live with people of the same age as they are. Intergenerational contact and communication, apart from within the family, is reducing significantly. So one of the reasons why the family becomes more important is the family is one of the few places where these vertical intergenerational exchanges happen. So you end up with a society which has tall, thin families linking the generations in a wide, flat, generationally segregated society. And some evidence that people are even aware of that, a Eurobarometer survey, and it shows that we have a particular problem in Britain. Um, evidence that people in Britain in particular, 76% of people in Britain, agree somewhat or strongly with the proposition there aren't enough opportunities for young and old people to uh, mix together. And the lack of contact between the generations increases distrust. One of the things that I think is most broken about broken Britain is the contract between the generations. And a lot of distrust and anxiety is distrust by one generation of another. So, very interesting. Um, uh, opinion poll asked across Europe, uh, asking adults if they'd intervene if they saw 14-year-olds vandalising a bus shelter. Much more reluctant to intervene in Britain. Adults are much more reluctant to intervene in Britain. They just think that those teenagers are dangerous and scary and will do horrible things to them. So you've got weakening of intergenerational communication. And that's why my book is really an appeal to intergenerational understanding. And uh, there, there is a, uh, a way in which one can do this, and this is a thought experiment that's been carried out by some researchers in America, is you get a group of people, volunteers, and you say, right, imagine <coughs> that you are the board of directors of a forestry company, and you've got a patch of woodland. What do you do with the patch of woodland? Will you please not cut down the woodland because if you delay cutting it down, its value to the company will increase and you will maximize your profits in the long term. In other words, an appeal to sort of enlightened, rational self-interest. Well, they, the people in this experiment, they are modestly uh, influenced by that argument. Then you try a second argument. You say, you, there's the low, it, please don't cut down the woodland so that the local community can enjoy the amenity of the world. In other words, horizontal obligation to fellow members of your community today. Uh, an appeal to altruism uh, within your own generation. Please don't cut it down so that other people can, so that people can enjoy it now. It has some influence, but not that great. Thirdly, you say to them, the only reason you've got this woodland is because previous generations and previous groups of people running this company did not cut it down. That's the only reason we've got it today. You have a similar obligation to pass it on to the next generation so they have it in the same form in which you have inherited it. That, people understand. That is by far the most powerful appeal for not cutting down the woodland. So my belief is that these kind of understandings are quite deeply embedded in us. And what we know from the, uh, about the evolution of morality and <coughs> obligation is that those, those type of exchanges between the generations do matter a lot to us. So people are susceptible to these appeals. <coughs> and that's really what my book is about. My book is, in a, that's why I do think it's reasonable to explain, uh, uh, to explain this 
and to appeal to the baby boomers. And so that we really think about the long term, I've given my lecture the date which Brian Eno has proposed we should use in order to think of the year in which we're living so that we approach these things with a suitably long-term perspective. Thank you very much. My name is Steve.